Story time with Stephanie Story. Hi, uh, my name is Stephanie Story. Welcome to my show, Story Time. I'm an art historical novelist, and this is where I talk to other writers about their process. My guest today is uh, uh, from Hollywood originally, which is where I met him. He and my husband used to work together. He's worked on shows like Seinfeld and Ellen and Wizards of Waz Waverly Place and New Adventures of Old Christine and lots of other shows out in LA. But now he is a novelist like me. He's written four books. They're detective books about um, Neil Shapiro. It's a series of detective novels. The latest one is called Dead West, where Matt takes his protagonist to Hollywood. We will hear about that. And it just came out on August 4th. So welcome to the show, Matt Goldman. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Um, I was telling you before this started that I'm excited to have a real conversation about a fellow Hollywood crazo turned to publishing um, yeah. because they are two such completely different industries. I, completely different. I can't yes. wrap my brain around it. Um, but before <laughs> we get to that, I do want to hear about the new book, Dead West. So uh, before we go on, just tell my readers at home yeah. a little bit about that plot and why you chose to take your protagonist back to Hollywood. Usually it's yeah. Minnesota people. Yeah, I think you said I'm from Hollywood, but I'm actually from Minnesota, but we met in Hollywood yes. and I was there for a long time. Uh, so I have this private detective series that stars my protagonist, Neil Shapiro, who lives in Minneapolis. And the first three books have all taken place in Minnesota. And they've been very Minnesotan, so much so that when my agent sent them out for foreign publication, uh, Sweden and Norway passed because they said my books were too Scandinavian. So, which I am not Scandinavian. I've never even been to Norway or Sweden. I was just writing about the Minnesota I know. And, and uh, apparently it's very Scandinavian. <laughs> uh, but that changed because uh, the, the first book, Gone to Dust, is coming out in Sweden this month, I believe. So I'm excited about that. But in Dead West, the fourth book, uh, it starts when a very wealthy couple who lives in St. Paul, and they're quite elderly, their grandson has just inherited his trust fund. And he has moved to Hollywood and they are scared to death. He's throwing away his millions investing in show business. And so they hire Nils to go out to Los Angeles and look into it. And he gets involved in, in Los Angeles and in, show, in a show business story. And I really wrote it to show, to show Hollywood from a Midwesterner's point of view. You know, I had to, I, I have mostly gone back and forth for the last 30 years and I never, I have lovely friends there. I, there's great people in Los Angeles. I'm not bashing Los Angeles, but I did always feel like an outsider. And it never felt like home. And every time I got off the plane, it's like, wow, this place is really weird and different, even though I lived there for years and years and years. So I just wanted to show that through Nils' point of view and have some fun showing what I know about show business as well. Okay. I've always, so I was born and raised in the South. I was born and raised in mm -hmm. Arkansas, so middle of the country. And you go out to LA and you're like, this place is bizarre. No wonder the movies are a little bit weird. Things yeah, like yeah, that yeah. happen in the movies. It's that weird. Yeah. But writing about, whenever I write about something in one of my novels, I always feel like I did get different perspective on it. Did you actually learn anything about Hollywood or see it in a different way by writing this novel? Well, a little bit. I, 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 I can't, I really came to see the, the pluses and minuses of it because uh, I had characters, as Nils commented, that this place, it seems weird. I had other ca characters speak up for what I know is true, but didn't really think about that much, which is LA is the Wild West. Like, it's a crazy place where you don't know what's going to happen. And a lot of that can be good. You know, in Minnesota, if you want to get from A to B in your career, or in a lot of things, there's a very kind of laid out way to do it. And you can't just leap to the top. In LA, that's not true. And in Hollywood, it's especially not true. You can be the hairstylist to a movie star one week and be producing that star's movie the next week. That's, that's not a metaphor. That's actually happened. Um, and actually to running a major studio. 
Um, and so, so that kind of potential and possibility, I think, is very exciting. And it attracts the best people in the world and the worst people in the world. Um, and so there's this real mix out there. Uh, and communities kind of form ad hoc uh, around the schools or, or work or rarely neighborhoods. <laughs> um, but, but really nice, there's great people there who are really talented and that's where they have to go to do their job. And then there's just people who are born there who are completely normal. I think a lot of the weirdos in LA are people who go there, fail in show business, but stick around anyway. <laughs> and this is what the book looks like, by the way. And, and, and I'm gonna put, a, put up a really pretty still too. Oh, that's so nice. We'll be, we'll, we'll, it's we'll been getting be staring great, at it. Great reviews. Yeah, so. it really has. People have really loved uh, this one. Not, I mean, but they've loved all of your books because you are, you, I mean, to me, you do come from that. You come from that television Hollywood world. You write great plots. Oh, thank you. Um, so you get people hooked in and, uh, and, and, and people love your books. So, and, and, and I love them. I just find them entertaining. Like they're just, the, they, they make me mad though. Cause I just stay up awake at night to figure out who did it. You know, I'm like, yeah. Matt, can't yes, see. I've been I've been accused of keeping people up past their bedtime um, yes. a number of times. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, but this is your fourth one of these. Yes. When you and the first three have all been set back in Minnesota, and so you're sort of returning back home first before you sort of bring him out to LA in this one. I keep thinking about I'm from Arkansas, and part of me loves Arkansas, and part of me hates Arkansas. But I right. would never want to set a book back in Arkansas. For I just, I just wouldn't want to do. I wouldn't want to delve into it again. I don't know if it would be fear of looking at myself or what. What made you want to go back to write about where you came from in Minnesota in the first place when you wrote the first book? Well, I I love Minnesota, and uh, I know it fairly well and to be able to write about it um you know you hold you hold even when you're not there you hold that place in you it's in your heart and in your mind and and when i couldn't be here when i was uh, a lot of the first three books were written either in los angeles or i was uh producing a show in vancouver or there and it was nice to be able to to hold this place in my heart minneapolis while i was there yeah. And it was weird writing. I was here uh, exclusively writing about uh, Los Angeles. So uh, that was strange, too. Um, and it would put me back there and it felt weird. And and also Nils, who's a Minnesotan, and and he I haven't spent a lot of time in Arkansas, but I do know it's similar to Minnesota in that you know, if you're real tough talking or a head bashing guy, you're just not going to get very far with people there, if, you know, because your job is to get information from people and they will just say, well, uh, I think you're being rather rude and no, thank you. I choose not to talk to you and shut the door. But when I had him be that kind of ingratiating nice guy in L.A., I, 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 I hadn't planned on this in the writing, but I discovered like he would just get walked all over there. Like no one's going to respect him. And so he had to change his kind of mode of operation and get a little more devious and tough, uh, which I thought was interesting. That is interesting because it is true. You can't be super nice and, and make it well in Hollywood or you will get trapped. No, it happened to me. Yeah, the, I, I had a reputation at one point for being too nice to be a showrunner. Um, you too? Mm -hmm. yeah. I had a reputation. I, I, nice to do it. So I tried to fix it. I tried to be mean, but I don't know if it did worked. it work. <laughs> well, now I'm writing books. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it worked too well. No, I'm not. I'm here by choice. Uh, uh, I mean, in, in fact, I just worked on a television show very, very recently. So um, you did. Um, well, okay. I, I am. Go ahead. I, I, I was just going to say, so how was that transition for you? Are you liking the being back to novels or do you miss TV? You just went back and did one. So maybe you missed some of that. Are you still juggling well, both? Where are you there? I am 100% back to novels. The reason I, I had decided a, after all these years to stop going back and forth. It was exhausting and expensive. And, and so I, I, and I love writing books. I absolutely adore it. So um, 
I thought, well, I'm probably done writing TV and I'll just write on books because I'm not going to Los Angeles anymore. Uh, and then, and then because of the pandemic, writers' rooms became virtual, and I got invited to join a show, just for two months. That was the agreement going in because I wasn't going to go out there for actual production. So I worked pre-production on a show, and and I loved being around smart, funny people. Even though it was like this, it was virtual. Um, that and you see people. Like now that I'm older, I'm the people a lot younger, and that's always inspiring to see really smart young people. Um, but but I am an introvert uh, by nature, and I really enjoy sitting by myself and working. That's that's my favorite thing to do. Uh, so I am 100% right now back writing books. It's another TV thing could come up, and I'm I'm not ruling it out. Um, uh, but I really do love writing books. I feel very much the same way. I'm like, this is what yeah. I love to do. But when the right person with the right project, people I like, they call, I go, well, I get, you know, if I can do it, I'll yeah. do it. But it just doesn't, it doesn't have the same pull that it did when I was younger and thought, well, I guess that's what I'll do. You know? yeah, that, that's how I kind of fell into TV too. Like, I guess I'll do that. I'll do that. And then you succeed at it and everybody tells you, well, well, you're so lucky. You're you're like, nobody gets to do that. And then, but it's, if it doesn't fit your personality well, which it doesn't fit mine well. um, I mean, I worked with great people. I worked on great shows, very smart and funny, but I always just liked the writing part, the show business part, not so much. You were a stand-up comic for a while. Yes. You wrote on a lot of, of, of sitcoms. Now, Niles is very funny. But the genre that you have chosen for your noveling life is crime detective world, which is yeah. a little bit different than the new adventures of old Christine. Okay. Yes, it and is. So, so how did you, were you always like a huge crime buff? Was this your first love? No. All into it. What happens? Always a big book buff. Okay. Always a big reader. Always wanted to write books. The short story is, you know, about 16, 17 years ago, the TV drama landscape changed. This is dramas. The Sopranos, The Wire, Breaking Bad, even on network TV, The Good Wife. Like, they got really good. Those shows changed Hollywood. It had always been, you want to work in film, and if you can't work in film, work in TV. But those shows made TV kind of the place to be, and TV was cool. And then they tried to make comedy cool. <laughs> and, you know, it's just... Comedy is not cool. These, you know, George Costanza is not cool. Like, but those characters and their flaws are what make them so human. And that was always the thing I was interested in. And I thought, well, when they tried to make comedy cool, I felt it wasn't the right place for me. And I thought, well, I'm going to work in drama because that's what I watch anyway, mostly. And to, to do my homework for drama, I started reading crime fiction. And... And much to my surprise, I found out, hey, when you have a crime driving your story, your characters don't have to carry the whole weight of everything because, you know, they get a call and say, hey, we got a fingerprint off the gun or something. <laughs> something else pushes the story forward and it frees up your characters so they can just be people and they can have relationships that aren't carrying the weight of the story. And that was exactly what I was missing from what had happened to comedy. I'd like oh, there's all this humanity here. Now, some crime fiction isn't like that. Some is just one tough guy walking around beating everybody up, but that's not what I do. And, um, and I, after kind of like falling into that genre and devouring book after book, I thought, I think I just, this is going to be the way I can write books. And so I had a few month break between TV shows and I just sat down and I wrote the first book, Gone to Dust, in those three and a half months. And that was that. Wow, you were. It takes me years to write, a, like years and years. Well, you have to do actual research. You're writing about real people yes. who painted real paintings, and I'm making up almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but did you always think when you were a kid, did you, since you were a devourer of books, were you always looking for a way to be a novelist and write books? 
Or did, did, did that just sort of occur to you as you were working in Hollywood? You were like, well, this is not the greatest fit. Maybe I'll go do that. Like, how did No, that- I always wanted to, but I just, I grew up in a world where I didn't know anybody who did that. I, I knew it was a thing, but I thought, I think I have to just go get a regular job. I mean, I was, I went to college for thinking I was going to go to medical school. I, I was a chemistry major. And then one year, my junior year, some friends invited me to go out and see stand up comedy. And, and then for some reason, like out of the blue, I thought I should be doing that, which is a, which I had never even thought about it before, never even considered it until I saw it live for the first time. And then once I got into stand-up, then I started to really love the writing part of it. And soon as I could transition full-time into writing. And then, you know, TV keeps you busy and TV pays you. And I had young kids. And it wasn't until both my kids went to college that I wrote my first book. I am so fascinated by the stark differences. Even though both industries are busy telling stories of some form that are trying to move people. The difference between the industry in Hollywood and the publishing industry to me is so could not be more different. It's night and day. It really is. The, the two things that surprised me the most is TV is such a collaborative industry. You're working with people all the time. Mm-hmm. You have no control over anything. You barely even have control over the, for me, I was a talk show producer, over the question yeah. I wrote. You know, I, I wrote it. I still didn't have control over it. It didn't matter. Right. Um, my husband was a sitcom writer like you. He's like, I didn't have control over which joke was used. Or, you know, I, I, you no, uh, yeah. So collaborative. And writing books is so not. And we've already talked about that we're both a little bit um, inter. You talked about you're an introvert. I definitely yeah. am. And I definitely prefer the writing by myself. Do you ever miss the collaborative nature? Or are you happy to be? I never, I've never missed it. Mm-hmm. Ever. Yeah. The, the big difference is it's so expensive to make a movie or a TV show that the victory out there is getting it made. That's the victory. And it's often not the quality that's the victory. Like that's a cherry on top if it's good, but it's like, they want to build a bridge. The important thing is building the bridge. It doesn't matter if it collapses when somebody goes over it, but it's not that expensive to produce a book. And so it's really about what's inside that book that becomes important. And uh, that is the biggest difference. So the kind of personalities that flourish in a situation where getting a multi-million dollar project made, they tend to be in Hollywood and the personalities that flourish over doing work that they can be proud of as much as possible. I mean, it is a business and there are books, there are bad books that sell well and that's okay because there's, I mean, there's something for everybody in all the mediums. Um, So one medium is not better than the other, but I think it's easier for the artist to do quality work in the book world because there's just not so much pressure on it. and nor is it up for so many people's interpretation, like actors, directors, set designers, wardrobe people, lighting people, you know, mm-hmm. 200 people work on a show and they're all important and their vision is all important. Mm-hmm. So no one's doing anything wrong if, if they change the writer's vision, they're bringing their own thing to it. And so when it succeeds, it's kind of this miracle that everything came together the way it did. I always say like writing a TV script is making a blueprint and then you hand it off and you don't know how that house is going to really get built and how it's going to get decorated. If it's going to have horrible mirrored walls and gaudy chandeliers or whatever it is. But when you write a book, you're building the house. That's the house. That's it. So, and I think that's often why people are disappointed when they read a book and then go see the movie because somewhere between the transition from book to script other people start interpreting the script not going back to the book and it becomes a different vision but so. i do feel that way about books that get made into movies they're they're two different animals it's like when i yeah. optioned this thing and people are like oh are you gonna write it are you gonna pre-? i'm like no 
I, I, I made those decisions. I, I got to your point. I got to build the whole house the way I wanted right. to build it. Now yeah. someone else is going to go out and make a different house. And that's their house. Yeah. No. That's great, by the way. Congratulations. Yeah. They, no, no. But I mean, it's, it, I didn't want, I, I don't, I, I made those choices for myself. And that's yes. so beautiful about the book writing industry. The other thing, I loved the way you put it, the difference between the two industries. Um, mm -hmm that you do get to feel like more control and, and, and you really want to craft a really good story. The other huge difference for me, which I actually had a harder time with in a weird way, was the urgency level uh, between television and publishing. It is so slow in publishing, like the response time to things. And I'm always like, oh my gosh, I'm used to getting a response two days ago from a question I asked today. Like right. the speed level, and I did, even though I love being quiet and I love taking my time with things, it was almost like getting off of a drug when I really left Hollywood and went to noveling. Like, oh, yeah. it's slow. Yeah. Did you have that experience or am I just crazy? Yeah, I mean, people get back to me in a reasonable amount of time, but there's not a lot to talk about, honestly. Yeah. Like, <laughs> there's, <laughs> you know, when you have a book tour, there's some talk about that. But that, you know, like I just signed a new two book contract. The first book of that two book contract is coming out summer of 2022. So no one's calling every day saying, hey, how's it going? <laughs> like the first draft is due in February of 2021 and I will make that easily. Um, but until then, they're not expecting to hear from me nor I from them. Right. So, you know, uh, you know, like, uh, a good review comes up in a newspaper or something and there's a little back and forth, but that's it. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's I, just I, not, thing I don't hear that. It's just that, that there wasn't any go, 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 go. It's like, right. No, 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 it's not. It's like, well, I'll talk to you next year. Yes. That's oh. it. I mean, what are, what are we going to talk about? Like how, how are you guys doing on ink? Do you have enough ink to print books? Like there's nothing to, there's nothing to talk about. No, there's not. <laughs> um. <laughs> okay, so your first four books have been about the same detective. Are you happy with, I mean, because some people really do get into covering same person and just different stories. Are you going to stick with Niles or Nils? Next two, the next two books are not Nils. <gasps> and they're are not. Are you happy about this? I, I, I am happy and devastated. I am, I am thrilled that I'm going to write two standalones. They're not going to be a series. They're going to be separate stories, but I'm not ready to stop writing Nils. So I'm trying to, th I don't have a contract for a fifth Nils book, but I have quite a bit of people who like them. So I'm not that worried about that, but I'm, I'm wondering like, do I have these two books to write, but I have two years to do it. Do I have time to write a Nils book in between them? Um, I don't know. I, I, I know that I have an emotional attachment to Nils because he got me into the book world in a really nice way. And I love being in the book world. Uh, the mystery writing community, that subculture of the book world is lovely. The booksellers and the librarians and the readers and the other authors are, you know, there's this great kind of camaraderie between the authors and this feeling from all the way to the top to the bottom if one of our books does well it's good for all of us which is a hundred percent true okay so we are all living through crazy moment in time yeah you have put out three books before this where when you were not promoting a book during a pandemic uh you put out this one on august 4th i my newest one came out yeah. on april 7th right in the middle of it as well it's a different experience, but considering it is. you were an introvert, did you like it better than having to travel around and do all the events or do you miss the in-person thing? I do like connecting with readers. Most of them are introverts as well. Uh, but but I, I miss libraries, I miss bookstores, I miss book clubs. Um, I It is a nice thing to connect with readers on a one-on-one -on -one level and and um i i've done quite a few virtual events and i had three requests for virtual events today just today um 
So I'm doing a lot and there's an advantage to this. Um, and I hope there are some bookstores that before the pandemic would and libraries would do this. They would videotape live and, and uh, an in-person event to broadcast live or in the future. And I hope that that continues because it really is a nice way to reach people all over the world. Um, you know, a, a good, a well attended book event is 50 people, um, and which is great. And I like the intimacy of that, but we can only reach so many people at a time. And I, I think the bookstores, uh, which I think they initially did to compete against the internet, sales you know they started connecting readers and writers together with with by having more book events and i think it's really valuable for the writers and the readers one other thing about this pandemic that we're going through that i hadn't thought to ask anybody else yet because it does not affect my writing right i write hundreds of years ago um what right. is happening today i don't have to i mean other than the fact that it does impact me and it changes the way that i see historical events so it has a big like artistic impact on me but I don't have to think about masks and social distancing. Are you, as a contemporary writer, having to deal with that? Are you setting, how are you wrapping your brain around that, Matt? Well, well I, and I've talked to a lot of authors about this. Um, my take on it is I'm not setting anything during the pandemic. I mean, my next book, the book that just came out in August was written before the pandemic, so it doesn't reflect anything. The next book's coming out in 2022, and I hope it's over, but I am referencing it, uh, that it happened. Um, because it does, you know, you don't, you have a character who wasn't able to see his parents as often. Uh, because of it. So things like that is, are what I'm doing. I'm not trying to pretend it never existed, um, but but I am referencing it. The same way a book written in 1922 should represent, represent the, the flu of 1918. Yep. Um, a lot of people died, like it would affect their lives. So, so that's what I'm doing. Okay, one last thing that I want, really wanted to ask you about um, the difference between your writing process as a TV writer and the difference between your writing process as a novelist. What's the one, cause like I still do three by five cards and it's, it, and it's just a hangover from being a screenwriter for yep. a long time. I really use three by five cards a lot, but on the other hand, um, my noveling life and the way I construct character is extraordinarily different than I would have when I was mm -hmm. writing screenplays. Are there things that are really similar about the way you your your personal writing process in writing scripts versus novels or things that are really different or is it pretty much the same for you it's not the same at all um uh there are things that are similar um dialogue uh characters relationships series architecture but everything else is different I don't outline. There was no room for a three by five card in my life. <laughs> you don't outline. I don't outline. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, I mean, I could talk about this for a long time if you want to bore your viewers. Um, but I, I, I have always maintained outlining is a waste of time. And the reason is I have worked on I haven't counted lately, but it's gotta be just shy of or just over 500 episodes of television. I didn't write them all, but I was one of the writers involved developing the story, getting it on its feet, seeing the script written, rewritten, all that. And I cannot tell you how many times that we had an outline that went through several revisions through the writer's room, finally got it to a place where we liked it. Studio had notes, rewrote it for the studio, Network had notes, rewrote it for the network. A script is written that follows the outline exactly and the script sucks. It doesn't work at all and it has to be thrown out. Yeah. And, and when you don't outline, your first draft is your outline. But I want those characters up on their feet, interacting. I view it more as build one true block at a time, everything, 
each character behaves in a manner that is true to them and don't make it boring <laughs> because when you if you when i all tv is done either with index cards or up on a whiteboard and you're using that part of your brain that organizes things and yeah. when you do that you're very logical about this can happen and that can happen and this can happen and for me when i do that i'm much more likely to come up with a story somebody else could have thought of because uh, i'm using my regular problem solving skills but when i write from the inside out and i get stuck believe me i get stuck every once in a while and i have to stop and figure things out but my solution comes from some place that's unique to me um and and not from that over that big board. The other thing I'm worried about with that big board is that I'm going to hammer characters into place to make them that story work. And so, so that's my other concern with it. It's so fascinating though, because like as historical fiction, I have to, I have to outline some yeah. because I'm dealing with actual events, which is where my yes. five cards come in. I have to yeah. know when this physically happened and when, and mm -hmm. I don't want to move that too much. Makes you know, total sense. Possible. But right. it would seem like for a crime writer, because you do have so much plot. So do you know what, what the end of the detective story is when you're writing or are you figuring out? I, I, I don't. I, I have a general idea. And sometimes it changes. And, and every day, you know, I, like I know more and more. I'm never at the end of the book thinking, I don't know what's going to happen. I have figured it out on the way. Um, but I don't initially know when I start. And, and you'd be surprised, most crime novelists do not outline. Some do, and, and there's, I mean, there's the argument, if I'm gonna build a bridge, I need to know where it's going to, and I understand that argument. But, but I, I think that I'm able to do it just from the education I got in television. When you work on that many stories, and not only work on them, you see them produced, you see what works and what doesn't work, you see them on air, you see what works and doesn't work, you eventually learn what roads not to take. Yeah. So, and it's not that I don't make mistakes, I do, but um, hopefully I fix them in subsequent drafts. But, but uh, the other thing about it is it's kind of fun, like you get the same excitement, you, you have as a reader, like you sit down and you're like, I wonder what's going to happen story today. Story time, <laughs> Stephanie, story, story time virtually. We've got time and plenty of stories, talking stories in a novel way. Story time, Stephanie, story.